to, to read. We've already dealt with two of them. John 18, verses 33 through 38. If you're using the Bibles under your seats, page 904 and 905. John 18, 33 through verse 38. Hear now the word of the Lord. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew, your own nation? And the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting, that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. And then Luke 12, verses 13 and 14. Page 871 in the Blue Bibles, Luke 12, 13 and 14. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man who made me a judge or arbitrator over you. And then finally Mark 6, verses 14 through 20, page 841 in the Blue Bibles. Mark 6, 14 through 20. King Herod heard of it, as the miracles that Christ was performing and the sending out of the disciples. For Jesus' name had become known. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said, he is Elijah. And others said, he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death, but she could not for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and the hearing of his holy word. Shall we pray together? O oh, blessed and sovereign Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we ask that today you would impress upon us from your word and by your spirit the great power of the gospel to, to change and, and to transform and reorient our lives to follow Christ wherever he leads us. Enable us to stand fast and, and to stand firm to stand firm on the solid foundation that He's laid for us by His completed work, His perfect work of redemption. And so may the church, the body of our Lord, as it is seen visibly before people, may she always be engaged in the great mission of making disciples for the glory of God. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week I received a higher amount of feedback than normal, uh, and it was good. It was it was helpful feedback. I really appreciated it. Um, many of you um, requested clarification on certain statements, and I, and I realized that uh, I had a lot of material that I had just had to cut out. I thought when I started this le uh, message, it would be just kind of a short, simple message, and 
and got more, way more uh, information than I could really get in the time allotted. Uh, but your um, questions were good, and I realized that uh, further argumentation and reasoning uh, and elucidation was probably uh, lacking, although hopefully uh, the gist of what we were saying was very clear. You know, at one time in the, in the history of the church, it was considered wrong, it was considered sub-Christian for a professing follower of the Lord Jesus Christ to be uh, involved in governmental affairs, either as a magistrate or working for Caesar in some capacity. It was thought to be unspiritual. That was beneath our calling as Christians. And yet again, we find that our Westminster Confession of Faith uh, has some very helpful, very instructive uh, counsel based on Scripture. And chapter 23 uh, tells us this, that it is lawful for Christians to accept and to execute the office of a magistrate when called thereunto. Of course, it goes on to explain more about uh, um, how do one should comport oneself and so forth. But it, it clearly is not against the will of our God and Scripture for a Christian to, to execute and to fulfill the office of one who leads the people in the civic secular arena. And certainly there are times uh, that this means working in a very godless environment, you know, much like Daniel did, uh, yet not being godless as they are or might be. And today we want to continue talking about this issue of the spirituality of the church, trying to make some sense of it. And we're still focusing primarily on the church as a united body, as the corporate uh, gathered body of Christ that meets and uh, seeks to do the will of the Lord. Uh, not necessarily gathered, but as a recognized church. But at the same time, we do want to take note um, that as individual Christians, as citizens of the commonwealth, as we interact with society and with the world, that our actions may be uh, quite differently um, oriented than the church united. And the point is that the church, as a church, as a united body, is to be the church engaged in the proclamation of the gospel and the making of disciples of all nations. That is the great, glorious commission that the Lord has given to His people. And it is the hope, it is the expectation, it may very well be, that as the gospel changes, as it influences hearts and minds of of large populations, of people groups, of, of nations, that there, may, there would be a governmental system that reflects the, the Christian view of the world. There may be a Christian magistrate, a horror of horrors. And as the state government follows Christ, you know, that disciple-making enterprise, it, it still continues. And it still advances. But the preaching of the gospel is always the primary task of the church. Okay, last time we saw from John 18, verses 33 through 38, that Jesus said to his disciple, or said to Pilate, that his kingdom is not of this world. His kingdom is not of this world. It doesn't originate from this world, it doesn't use the world's norms doesn't operate as the world does, doesn't function like the kingdoms of this world function. But the kingdom of Christ is in this world. And the key focus in John 18, as Jesus answers Pilate, 
is this otherworldly origin and focus of the kingdom of Christ, this kingdom that is now uh, that is now identified and is now encapsulated within the church for the most part. Spiritual focus of the church is about the mission of the church more than where the church is, is located or how visible it is. And then we saw from the Luke 12 passage, uh, we saw how just how laser focused Jesus was on his mission, upon his task. He refused to be sidetracked from that mission. And when someone in the crowd interrupted his teaching and requested that he become a, an arbitrator in a family dispute involving dividing of the inheritance, he refused. Now, he didn't necessarily dismiss out of hand all the underlying issues. And matter of fact, he goes on to talk about the issue of covetousness and possessions. You know, clear, important concepts and ideas that play into uh, the world that we live in. And so we need to keep this in mind when we later observe that the spirituality of the church does not mean that the church is to be silent about the underlying biblical and moral issues that take place in the civic realm. The power the church has, it, it's, it's a spiritual power. That means that the power that Christ has given to His church is ministerial. It's for serving. It's for blessing. It's for building up, for edification. Now, of course, it also is declarative. The church does not have original power to simply make legislation. It declares what has already been delivered by God in His Word. The power is declarative. It's not authorized to impose the Word of God by physical force or by physical sanction. Church's power is spiritual. Now, then the text we didn't address last time is Mark 6 and verses 14 through 20. And here from this text, we get another uh, perspective, another um, idea, a facet of the spiritual nature and mission of the church. And here we see a spokesman for God speaks out against a magistrate's immorality. A spokesman for God speaks out very clearly and very forcefully against a magistrate's immorality. Now, there may be a question that arises as to the role of John and his relationship to the church. But we can, we can safely say that even before Acts chapter 2, the church existed. It may have had different uh, structure and a different form, but the church as the people of God has always existed. And John the Baptist was a member of that church. And he was a spokesman of such. Now, in this passage, we see Mark informing us how John the Baptist has, had, had met his de demise, how he, how he died. Jesus' fame was spreading out all over the country, becoming more and more uh, known, particularly in the northern regions of Israel where Herod Antipas uh, ruled. And in seeing and, and in trying to account for the miracles that Jesus was doing, many people were coming up with different theories as to where these powers had come from and the source. And Herod's theory was that Jesus was John the Baptist come back from the dead, and the idea was that because he had been resurrected, he had these resurrection powers at work in him. Jesus did. Herod had uh, executed John. He had him beheaded. Um, and, and John had been continually saying to Herod, and by the way, in verse 18, I take the, uh, the words had saying in a continuous sense, that John just didn't do this one time. He, could, he had been in a regular habit of pointing out Herod's immorality. And Herod ended up beheading John because John frequently rebuked Herod for violating God's law, for marrying 
the wife of his brother Philip, a woman that was named Herodias. Now, it was actually Herodias who plotted and who, who schemed to get John beheaded. And Herod himself, we're told, he had a certain respect for John as a preacher. He enjoyed listening to him, perplexed by what he was saying. But the point that we want to notice, and that relates to our topic, uh, a preacher of the truth, a preacher of God's word, spoke out against a magistrate's immorality. Herod's immorality was both personal and it was public. So is this a, a paradigm of sorts for preachers of the gospel to publicly denounce uh, personal and public uh, immorality of civic leaders? Well, actually it is. But I do have to tell you, if, if, if we spent time denouncing civil leaders for their personal and public immoralities, and it, was, it would certainly be bipartisan, it wouldn't leave much time for the preaching of the gospel. The problem with a lot of churches and preachers is that their denunciation of leaders falls along party lines. We denounce the ones we don't like, and we uh, excuse the ones that we do. But uh, John, he was an equal opportunity denouncer. He wasn't a pastor in the New Covenant sense of the word, uh, so... Pastors and elders certainly need to be wise and discerning um, about developing any kind of reputation about uh, a denouncer of leaders or a rebuker of, of politicians. Uh, there have been many who have sought uh, a preacher, who have sought to be bold and to rebuke a leader for personal or, or for public immorality, only later to be found out engaging in the same. So, we need preachers like John the Baptist. We also need preachers who are truly righteous and holy like John the Baptist before they ever begin to crank up the volume. Now, remember again, the common thread in all these texts is the intersection, the colliding, the confronting, coming into contact with uh, the, the church or a representative of the church and in some respect, Jesus or John the Baptist um, with a representative of the civil sphere. But let's be clear on what we mean by the spirituality of the church. Here's what we mean. Uh, when we reference the spirituality of the church, we're not talking about the church or we're not talking about Christians uh, 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 being spiritual as opposed to being worldly. And, uh, worldly in the way that they live. What we mean is that the church, as the church now, as the united body of Christ, the visible church of the Lord, has a spiritual, heavenly mission. And that mission is to proclaim the good news of Christ's death, His burial, His resurrection, His ascension to heaven. And the reason that this is good news is because it means that the greatest problem that man has, has which is his sin, which is his rebellion, against God. And that has led to every other problem, to every other malady in life. That this greatest problem has been solved when a person submits, comes to Christ by faith, trusts in the person and work of what Christ Jesus did on the cross. In faith alone, trusting in Him. And so the spiritual mission of the church is to tell the world what the real problem in life is and what the real answer to that problem in life is. The world's problem is its sin, its rebellion and defection and alienation from God, the one who created them. And it's only in Christ, only in Him is their life, true life, spiritual life realized. 
And so the good news is that what you cannot do for yourself, which is to save yourself, to, to reorient this fallen world, what you cannot do to save yourself, God does. In and through Christ Jesus. Only through faith and allegiance to Him. And so the mission and the message, in one sense, is really very simple. Jesus Christ came to save sinners, of which we all are. And by faith in Him, we have salvation. You've sinned against God. I have sinned against Him. And really, the thing is, that when people want what, uh, something other than what God has for them, the Lord, the Lord will give people what they want. And the problem is that we really don't realize that what we want is not what we want. That the end of, a, of what we think is right is actually death. So Jesus rising from the dead proves all that He said is true. You can live a great life now. But the real life begins when you stand before Almighty God, the judge of all the earth. And when you give an account for whether you have believed and trusted in what He's told you. Now we talked about Westminster Confession of Faith 31.4, the parameters and, and the boundaries that it, it gives to the church to keep her on track with this great mission. Um, and if in the preaching of the gospel it does become imperative to address civil matters in order to further and to advance the proclamation of the gospel, then she must do it. You know, we found this to be true four years ago during the lockdowns as the proper jurisdiction of the church in many places was being invaded, was being violated by the civil magistrate. Thankfully, in this state, uh, there was a, was a pulling back, but still there was the idea that the church wasn't all that essential and could be encroached upon and told how to, how to worship, when to worship, what to do in their worship. And the church needed to speak up, to speak to the magistrate, to keep the gospel from being silenced, from being squelched, from being diluted, from being overrun. And so last time, you recall, we, we made several applications from this teaching of the spirituality of the church. Uh, I'm not going to repeat them in the interest of time. You have the ones we covered there in your notes. You see them from last week. Uh, notice most of those applications on the spirituality of the church uh, deal from the vantage point of the church keeping out of the business of the state. But today... The applications mainly go the other way. And we want to observe some of the positive ways, although they may be couched in some negative uh, terms, but some positive ways the church should view and should positively interact with the civil magistrate. And the first one is this, letter E. The spirituality of the church doctrine means that the church must be concerned and interested in civil affairs and leaders of the state. The church must be concerned. The church needs to be interested in civil affairs, in the leaders of the state. So the spirituality of the church does not say, does not teach, whether we're talking about the church as the, as, as the church or as individual Christians, that we are to be apathetic or dismissive or antagonistic to the civil or societal sphere. You know, Paul tells God's people to pray for kings and all who are in high positions of leadership. We are to do this as a church. That's one of the things we should be doing when we gather together. The church corporately and the church individually should strive to be uh, helpful and 
to be um, supportive citizens and encourage civic leaders in their duties and responsibility. The uh, institution of the state, infected by sin as it is, as is the family and the church. The state still is a servant of God, a minister, literally a deacon of God for good, as Paul says in Romans 13, verse 4. And so one of the things we seek to do, especially in our pastoral prayers, is to pray for our leaders, to pray for their protection, their health, their prosperity, their wisdom. Doesn't matter who it is, we pray for them. Another thing the spirituality of the church also means, it means that the church may speak on a matter when requested to do so by the state or when times are extraordinary and Christians need guidance and they need assurance. The state may speak, or the church may speak when requested by the state. And of course, there are times that are extraordinary that Christians need guidance and they need assurance. You all, as we all do, we live in a world in which things are happening around us and impact us. And we can't just pretend it doesn't affect us. It does. Now, sadly, today it seems that many civil leaders just don't care what the church has to say about various matters unless there happens to be some political advantage to it. As I mentioned last time, our denomination, there have been a few times they have pronounced on a particular matter, um, I believe almost 10 years ago, whenever it was, uh, I believe it was same-sex marriage issue, and it was because a member of Congress requested, made a formal request to uh, the Presbyterian Church in America to, to speak to that very hotbed issue at the time. There were a lot of churches that were falling like dominoes and getting involved and, and getting behind it. And uh, the, the congressman, I think it was a couple of them, wanted to show that there were other churches that did not agree. You know, as for times and as for circumstances being extraordinary, well, that is wisely left up to the judgment of the church. But I believe that you can make a very good case that the times we're in right now are quite extraordinary. That what's going on around us, we instinctively know there's something not right of what's happening. Our children are growing up in a society that calls good evil and evil good. And everyone seeks to do what's right in his or her own eyes. Now, I know people don't like fire and brimstone preaching. I mean, who really does? But maybe it's time to bring it back. Because fire and brimstone are true spiritual realities. All right, we have two more applications, and I'll, I'll try to do them quickly. The spirituality of the church teaching means, thirdly, though the church, and this is what we're talking here, the church as a church, though the church does not get entangled in civic affairs, individual Christians should be involved and engaged to bring the Christian worldview and ethics to bear on the civic realm. The church is not to be entangled in civic affairs, the affairs of the commonwealth. But that doesn't mean individual Christians are not to be involved. They should be involved. Now, the window is very small for the church, as the church, to intermeddle in the affairs of the civil magistrate, just as the window is small the other way around for the magistrate to interfere in the affairs of the church. But the window's wide open for individual followers of Christ as citizens 
You know, if you're a soldier, if you are a government employee, if you're a public school or a university educator, maybe an elected official at whatever level, or even maybe a contractor uh, supporting the state in some way, as a follower of Christ, you cannot, you must not check your Christian credentials at the door or leave them in the parking lot when you enter the office. It's all of Christ for all of life. Now, I'm not suggesting that you uh, preach or turn the office into an evangelistic service. Um, but what I'm saying is that your first allegiance is to Christ. It's to Christ. He's your king. He is your head. He is your sovereign. God is His people in all areas of the civic realm to be salt and to be light. And your king tells you to be a good soldier, to be a good and trustworthy governmental employee, to be an ethical contractor or whatever. That's what you do as a follower of Christ. You to use wisdom, discernment, good judgment, sanctified judgment as you carry out your duties and your responsibilities to Caesar. And we see in Scripture that it's filled with examples of, of his people being in the halls of, um, of pagan, non-Christian governmental leaders. You think of, of Joseph. Or of Daniel, as we read about earlier. Or of um, uh, Hananiah, of uh, Mishael and Azariah, commonly probably known better as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Nehemiah or Cornelius. There were other, those of Caesar's household that were believers. Working in Caesar's household. And your work is important. And it's vital. Know how to wisely, persuasively, know how to effectively influence and argue, argue with good sense, with sound reasoning, biblical reasoning to demonstrate the Christian worldview, to show how the truth of God is revealed. Neutrality is really a myth. It doesn't really exist. One is either for Christ or against Christ. Now, you need to recognize that your non-Christian colleagues and bosses will, because of God's common grace, that they will have some good ideas. And you need to give honor where honor is due. But also be mindful that, especially in times like these, that your worldview is hated. Your Lord and Savior is despised. And that taking a stand for Christ in the civic realm could very well cost you. And so you need to make up your mind ahead of time that you will not, like Daniel, defile yourselves with the king's delicacies nor betray your Lord whenever the chips might be down. Last application, we'll touch on this briefly. That the spirituality of the church means that the state has no jurisdiction, that is no right to interfere with the mission of the church as it ministers the word and the sacraments. There's no jurisdiction the state has to assume that to herself. Now we covered this in some detail a few years ago and if, if you want more uh, information on this I'll just refer you to the messages uh, from February 28 March 21 and March 28 of 2021 there we went into some detail on that and they addressed these, these uh, jurisdictional issues of both church and state and what to do if or should they be, be violated and so, without going into any extended uh, history of this jurisdictional issue, you need to know that we stand on very 
solid biblical authority with those who recognize a proper separation of the church and the state, which is totally from what has, has tended to happen today in our society with the concept of, of separation of God and the state. The church or the state does not. The state uh, should not accept ever the church dictating how it governs. That's not the church's role. We should not tolerate the state telling us what to believe and how to worship. In past history, we know that the church essentially controlled what the state did, who became king or who was affirmed or confirmed as such or whatever appointments were made. You know, for most of our country's history, the state and the church have, I would say, enjoyed a pretty good, respectful, mutually beneficial relationship. But that seems to be rapidly changing. We're moving more into what's known as a negative world where Christianity is no longer viewed by the larger society as positive. Most, 20 years or so ago, were at least tolerant or indifferent. Even that is no longer the case. Today, the church, the Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church today is considered in many quarters immoral. So will we be prepared and will we be faithful if the state were to revoke our tax-exempt status because it says that we proclaim hatred and bigotry? Will we cave if the state tells us to admit unrepentant homosexuals into leadership and membership and to affirm transgenderism? Will we register with the government out of national security concern? Well, if we fail to understand the spirituality of the church, if we fail to understand her mission, her mandate, her message, all of this based upon the Great Commission, if we fail to understand this, we'll prostitute the church. So these past two weeks, I hope you understand that the point is not for us to be uh, unconcerned or apathetic or dismissive of, of what goes on in the civic realm. No, we care. We should care. We must care. And more of us should, should become involved, at least on the local level. But as we seek to make sense of the church's mission to make disciples, as we try to make sense of the spirituality of the church. It's just imperative that we know what the church is and what she is called to do and how she's called to do it and what the church is not called to do. Expect the church to be the church. To be the divinely appointed means for knowing Christ for learning His will for your life. And as you learn Christ, as we teach His disciples all things He commanded them, you'll learn what to do about the civic realm, about politics as a citizen under the rule of Caesar, but ultimately under the rule and the Lordship of Christ. The church is appointed to preach the gospel and to teach the gospel. If you get that right, everything else, including politics, falls into its proper place. And God is glorified. O Lord of heaven and earth, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we do care about the world in which we live. We care about our governors our magistrates, our neighbors, and our community. The earth belongs to you, O Lord God, 
and all that's contained therein. And so as we seek to make sense of the mission that you've given to your church, O oh Lord, keep us focused on. And, and may we always be confident in the power of God unto salvation through the gospel. And when there are needs in our world that we can meet, O oh God, let us be quick to respond with, with food or with clothing, money or support because the gospel, it leads us to bind up wounds and to care for the brokenhearted. Oh, but in all these endeavors, let the purpose for which our Savior came, for which He bled and died, may it never be lost. May it never be subsumed in just mere activity. Let the church proclaim Christ, the precious and only Savior, the bringer of salvation with passion and with compassion. We pray in and through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's sing to our Savior.